We're going to follow right along with the study from last Sunday. We're going to pick up in the very next chapter. Last week in chapter 8, we saw how that God was giving Ezekiel a vision. Uh, He had taken him from Babylon spiritually, grabbed him by the hair, dragged him spiritually, plopped him down into Jerusalem, and there was showing him this supernatural vision of what was going on behind the scenes in the temple and around the temple. And specifically, Pastor Lance took us through four abominations. Do you remember those four sins that were so wretched to God that God makes this statement, it's because of these abominations that I'm going to leave. They're driving me away. And and we see now through chapters 8 and all the way through chapter 11 of Ezekiel, um, uh, kind of a, a part by part, step by step story of the Holy Spirit departing the temple and then departing Jerusalem. Uh, it's, a, it's a scary, sad story, but we made a connection on Wednesday night that even as the Spirit departs Jerusalem, the promise is made that He'll return again. And we looked at that on Wednesday night how Jesus, through His ministry, restored the glory, not just to the temple, but to our very lives. That's a, it's an amazing picture of how God has redeemed and restored and brought the glory back. We've been made in the image of God, and Jesus has restored the image of God to us. Amen? So if you were not here Wednesday night, really encourage you to go back to the website, listen to the whole study. Uh, it, was, it was pretty good. I'll just have to tell you. It was, it was pretty good. So. All right, now we're going to pick it up now in chapter 9, and I'm going to warn you ahead of time, this gets pretty heavy. This is a heavy message of doom and judgment, and yet in the midst of it, we are going to find an incredible picture of the gospel, that we're going to see that in his wrath, God always remembers what? Mercy. God remembers mercy in his wrath. So let's look at verse 1. Then he called out in my hearing with a loud voice saying, let those who have charge over the city draw near, each with a deadly weapon in his hand. And suddenly six men came from the direction of the upper gate with faces, uh, which faces north, each with his battle axe in his hand. Oh, this is a terrifying vision now. It shows us what's about to fall upon Jerusalem when the Babylonians invade This vision begins with angelic guards who are called for judgment on the city. They have battle axes in hand. Uh, The Hebrew term there is actually smashing weapons. Smashing weapons. This is ominous now. These people have charge over the city, these these angelic uh, beings. Uh, It says they have charge. The, The term means guards. They're usually protecting the city, but here... Uh, they've been given the job of ushering divine judgment upon the city. We read next, it says, one man among them was clothed with linen and had a writer's inkhorn at his side. They went in and stood beside the bronze altar. So in addition to the axe-wielding angels, there's another being, a, a heavenly scribe, carrying the implements of writing, Uh, So they present themselves before God at the altar, symbolizing that there's sin that's going to be dealt with, just as the place of the altar is where sacrifices have always been made to to cover sin. Um, They're they're presenting themselves at the altar now, a picture of sin that needs to be dealt with. We read on at verse 3. Now the glory of the God of Israel had gone up from the cherub where it had been to the threshold of the temple. We see God moving from his holy place out to the threshold. We went in depth on that on Wednesday night, looking at God moving away from the Holy of Holies and out of the temple. And then it says, he called to the man clothed with linen who had the writer's inkhorn at his side. And the Lord said to him, go through the midst of the city and through the midst of Jerusalem and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done within it. So we see the assignment of this heavenly scribe. He's to mark the forehead of all those who are weeping in grief over the abominations, the abominable sins that are being committed flagrantly uh, before God. There's, There's people who are sighing and groaning over those sins. Not everybody's on board with those sins. There's some people who are grieved over those sins. They're, they're, in the words sighing and groaning, it, it's kind of a play on words in Hebrew. They're very, very, uh, they're very similar sounding words. The word for sigh is a 
him that speaks of groaning and pain. And then the other word cry is an akim. So it's an ahim and an akim. And the word an akim, it's a lamentation to the point of sickness. So can you imagine that kind of grief over something? So much it hurts you and it makes you sick. So much grief that, you, that your, your insides are just torn up over it. They're sick over it. Their hearts are breaking with that which breaks God's heart. We used often, some, sometimes we'll sing a song. It's funny, I just said we often, sometimes, and I don't know. When was the last time we did this song? I don't remember. There's a song we've sang called Hosanna, and there's a line in that song that says, break my heart with what breaks yours. That needs to be our prayer to God, Lord. I want the things that break your heart to break my heart. That's what's happening here. And as they're lamenting to that point of pain and sickness over the sinful condition of Jerusalem, they're seen by God. God notices that. And that angel comes by and he marks them on the forehead. Now, do you think that's a physical mark that people can see? No, that's an angelic mark that it's in the spiritual realm. It's for the spiritual beings to see that that person's been marked by God. That person has a mark on them. Before we get into what that mark means, I want to talk a little bit more about grieving over sin. As I was studying for this, I was kind of checking my own heart. Lord, Lord what, what happens in my heart when I see sin? You know, we live in an increasingly twisted and broken society. And every day in the news, it's, it's more shocking than the day before. Amen? It's so crazy that sometimes our natural response and my natural response is to shake my head in disgust. And sometimes I just mock the craziness. And there's a lot on social media that just kind of mocks the craziness, one side mocking the other side all the time. That's, we jump into that battle of mockery. I do that quite often. My friends, we have to be broken over the sin of our world. We can't be callous to it, which happens as we mock it. As we mock something, we sort of become numb to it and we, you know, we just never see it from the way God sees it. We have to cry out to God over it. It, it. God is looking for people's people whose hearts are in line with his heart. King David had a heart that was after God's heart. We, we, we should desire, Lord, break my heart with what breaks yours. In the book of 2 Peter, chapter 2, it says that Abraham's nephew Lot in the Old Testament, remember as he lived in Sodom and Gomorrah, he was an example for us. You don't see that very often in the Bible, that Lot is an example. But here in 2 Peter, it says this. 2 Peter 2, I'm going to read from the New American Standard, if you're interested, on this part. It says this, in verse 7. And if he rescued righteous Lot, oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men, for by what he saw and heard, that righteous man, while living among them, felt his righteous soul tormented day by day after uh, by their lawless deeds, then the Lord knows how to rescue God, the godly from temptation. We don't often think of Lot as a righteous person. Like a righteous person chose to live in Sodom, you know? And he didn't seem to do much in that city, and yet God considered Lot righteous for one key reason— because he was tormented day by day over the shameless, sinful sexuality of his city. Because the sin of that city weighed so heavily upon him. God looked at Lot and said, that's a righteous man. Explains why the angels went in there to drag him out before the destruction fell. You see, someone else in scripture who was often broken over sin, that's Moses. At one point, he was grieving and fasting and praying over the sin of his people for 40 days. I don't think I've ever had a 40-day fast because of the sin of my society. My friends, we have to look at the world from God's point of view and be broken over the devastation that it brings to people's lives. I like how Psalm 119, 136 reads. It says this, rivers of water run down from my eyes because men do not keep your law. 
simply by the fact that God is holy and righteous and people don't keep his law should cause rivers of tears to flow from our eyes because God is holy and he deserves holiness and righteousness. If our hearts aren't breaking, and sometimes I can say quite often, my heart isn't breaking over the disastrous results of sin in my society. Uh, I think I need and we need a serious heart check. Let's pray that God softens our hearts. Amen. Let's read on now, verse 5. To the others in my hearing, so now we're speaking of those axe-wielding angelic beings, he says, go after him through the city and kill. Do not let your eyes spare nor have any pity. Utterly slay old and young men, maidens and little children and women. Please do not read on. We'll wait right there. I'll save that next phrase for a bit. So the guards are sent out to destroy in God's wrath. For everyone who's not turned to God, this is the day of judgment for them, the day that's been warned of for quite a while now. And I have to tell you, when I read this, it seems really cruel on God's part, doesn't it? That, for, that, that passage just, just grabs you. I'm like, wow, Lord, what are you doing here? It seems extremely cruel that God would strike innocent and vulnerable women and little children, right? And a lot of people might accuse God of injustice at this point. But my friends, it's missing something really important. It's the, the question, what is, God, what is Ezekiel actually seeing in this vision? How is this judgment happening? How is this judgment happening? Well, remember the history. Jerusalem was physically attacked and pillaged by whom? You're sleeping out there. Who attacked Jerusalem? The Babylonians, right? It's described in 2 Chronicles 36. I'll read you a little bit of this because the, the people of Judah had rejected God and rejected the prophets that God sent to them and they were despising God's word. It says this, therefore he brought against them the king of the Chaldeans, that's Babylonians, who killed their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary and had no compassion on the young man or, or the virgin or the aged or the weak. He gave them all into his hand. So the destruction of Jerusalem was an actual historical event. And so we know those, those beings with the smashing hammers are not directly attacking Jerusalem. This isn't going to be a supernatural event like when the death angel in Egypt wiped out the firstborn. It's not like that. Or like when the angel wiped out the Assyrian army years earlier before Jerusalem. No, this is a, an actual attack by the Babylonians. So what's the purpose of, in this vision of these axe-wielding angels? It's likely that those angels, you know, have been assigned Jerusalem as their territory to oversee, the, 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 the guards, the watchmen, and they're going to make sure the Babylonians don't overstep the boundaries that God has set for the attack. God has said exactly what's going to happen in, in this attack. He has set boundaries that the Babylonians can't go past, and it's, gonna, it's all going to play out exactly as God foretells, and, and so these angels are making sure the Babylonians don't do more than they can do. It's sort of like when God lets Satan attack Job, right? And God says to the devil, there's certain things you can and cannot do. Now, Satan was attacking Job, but he was kind of under the restrictions that God put on him, and it's very similar here. And the point is this, even as we read those hard words, Babylon is to blame for that horrific slaughter, not God. God isn't to get the blame. It's the work of the satanic Babylonian nation that God has permitted a season of unbridled rampage, but even as God allows them to conquer, he makes sure the battle turns out exactly as he decrees. It's as the Old Testament prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah and even Habakkuk, it's as they explain that Babylon is simply a tool in God's hands for the discipline and correction of his people. But because Babylon has pursued their conquest in their arrogant pride and their savage brutality, they will later be judged for their own sin and their day of judgment will come for them as well. I see that's the mystery of God's sovereignty in world affairs. Humankind has free will, but God's ultimate design for history is carried out. People are still responsible for their own choices and actions, but God's will prevails in the end. Got it? That's deep stuff for an early Sunday morning. 
Okay, let's finish verse six. Now we get to that great phrase that I kind of held off until now. God says to those angelic beings, but do not come near anyone on whom is the mark. So now we get to those who are marked. They are rescued from God's wrath, we see. This is kind of like the Passover event from Exodus. You remember that? You know the story. Those who trusted in God followed the instructions, prepared and ate the Passover lamb as they were supposed to in faith. And they would take the blood and put it on the doorpost. And then on the night that the firstborn are killed in the last plague in Egypt, what will happen? The death angel will pass over those homes with the blood on the doorpost. And, no, and everyone in the house is, is protected and safe from that, that night of wrath. Uh, God would see that blood marked on the doorpost and see that as a sign of faith and trust in him. Now, unlike the visible Passover blood that would mark one's home, here in Ezekiel, the mark is only seen in the spiritual realm. But my friends, it's just as effective. They were untouchable because they belong to God. I want to go a little bit deeper now into that divine mark. I did a little word study looking into that mark, and there's something amazing in the text about that word, mark. The text literally says in Hebrew, put a tav or a tav on their foreheads. Tav is a Hebrew letter. So God is saying put a Hebrew letter on their foreheads. In the earliest Hebrew script, the tav was shaped just like, well, you could probably guess, a cross. It was a T mark. Later, the Hebrew script kind of changed and morphed until we get to the modern version of Hebrew. But the, the earliest Hebrew script, the, the, the mark would have been a, a T mark. Now, by the time of Ezekiel's day, it, might have, it was kind of rotating kind of more of an X, so maybe X marks the spot. But my friends, it's totally possible that in his vision, Ezekiel saw the sign of the cross on the foreheads of those who were marked by God. I can't prove that emphatically, and Ezekiel didn't draw us a picture. And he probably would not have even understood the implications of a cross at his point in history. But throughout the centuries, since the early church, this vision has been regarded as a clear prophetic picture of the gospel. Because when we put our trust in Jesus and follow him, calling upon him for salvation, we are marked by the blood he shed on the cross. We have a mark on us. Spiritually, there's a mark of the cross on us. And we can trust that we are safe under his mark. You don't have to wear a cross necklace. You don't have to get a cross tattooed on your forehead. If you put your trust in Jesus, God sees that cross very clearly. Guess who else sees that cross very clearly? Our, our enemy, the devil. Paul says in Galatians 6, May we never boast in anything but the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. We don't boast in any external mark or sign, no human effort or man-made qualification. We are to be known for one thing only, that the cross of Jesus has transformed us, that we are redeemed and made new by his work, and we are set apart for him alone and for his purposes in our lives. When you put a mark on something, it belongs to you. It's for your purposes, right? I'm going to continue now, finish the text, speaking now to those angelic beings. He says, and begin at my sanctuary. So they began with the elders who were before the temple. Judgment beginning with the elders, those who had led the city into so much idolatry and heresy. Judgment beginning at the house of God. Verse 7, then he said to them, defile the temple, fill the courts with the slain, go out. And they went out and killed in the city. So it was while they were killing them, I was left alone and I fell on my face and I cried out and I said, oh Lord God, will you destroy all the remnant of Israel in pouring out your fury on Jerusalem? And Ezekiel sees the bodies piling up in the streets as he has this vision of what's going to happen in the Babylonian attack and he, he sees the siege and the attack on the city and there's mass carnage and Ezekiel's not sure if anyone is even spared and he wonders out loud to God, is this it? Are there going to be any survivors? There's so many bodies and he's just overwhelmed in his vision. Can you imagine having that vision? This is, this is like a, a horror movie. This is terrible and he's freaking out. He wonders, will there really be a remnant? Or is this the end of Israel? 
Well, God answers this question in verse 9. He said to me, The iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceedingly great. And the land is full of bloodshed. And the city full of perversity. For they say the Lord has forsaken the land and the Lord does not see. So as God begins to answer Ezekiel's question, the answer is not great. He's like, wait a minute. Lord, are you saying this is true? Everyone's going to be wiped out because the sin is so horrific. Well, let's get to what they're saying. The, 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 those under judgment have been saying the Lord has forsaken the land. The Lord does not see. And so because they think that God isn't watching and that he's forsaken them, they act like it. And they've been telling themselves these lies for generations and turning to the false gods and the idols because of it. So what came first? Their sinful way of thinking or God's discipline upon them? Well, it starts with their sinful thoughts towards God. Bad theology leads to bad behavior. Can I say that again? Bad theology leads to bad behavior. You know, what you believe about God is the most important thing about you. Your theology, what do you believe about God? That's going to chart the way you think and the way you live and behave. Don't ever harbor thoughts such as, God doesn't care. That's a lie. Or, God doesn't love. That's a horrible lie. Or, God is absent and he doesn't see me. Or that sin and holiness don't really matter to God. My friends, those are all satanic lies. And they're going to lead you to live that way. Your theology, what you believe about God, is critically important. Well, as God has been answering Ezekiel, the, the answer doesn't seem great. Seems like God is saying, yeah, everyone's going to be destroyed. But then we get to verse 10. Look at verse 10. It says, And as for me also, my eye will neither spare nor will I have pity, but I'll re recompense their deeds upon their own head. Yeah, this looks like judgment. This looks bad. God's affirming this. There's massive death and destruction happening and Judah's being judged. If the conversation ended right there, Ezekiel would say this has been a huge bummer. God has failed in his promises. This is horrible. But what about those people that God marked? What's going to happen to them? Are they going to survive? Well, don't worry. Here we go. Keep reading verse 11. Just then, the man clothed with linen who had the ink horn at his side reported back and said, I have done as you commanded me. Yes, indeed. What happened? That angelic scribe had done his job just as God had commanded. Those who had grieved over sin were marked for redemption and rescue. They were not under God's wrath. These were God's faithful. This was God's remnant. They were untouchable. Now, historically, these would have been the ones who obey Jeremiah's instructions in Jerusalem later on, and they, they leave the city willingly. They go out to the Babylon, Babylonian army as refugees, and they are taken peacefully into exile, and they're in exile in Babylon. They live, you know, their lives in generation after generation for 70 years, and God flourishes them and prospers them, protects them, and makes them light and salt in that, in that world. God makes good on his promises, they're going to live out their lives with God's blessing and presence with them. God knows who, whom he has marked, and he is faithful to them, faithful with his promises. I'm going to end now by looking at a passage in Revelation. If you want to turn there, you can. Just two verses, seven, uh, chapter 7, 2, and 3. Revelation 7, 2, and 3, if you want to turn there. Just two quick verses, though. It's an amazing connection to Ezekiel's vision Here's what we read. Revelation 7, 2, it says, Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried out with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. Does that sound familiar? Exactly what happened in Ezekiel's day, when the judgment on Jerusalem fell, here in Revelation at the end of times, in the tribulation, 
God will be marking once again the foreheads of his faithful. You know, Revelation, we talk about the mark of the beast, right? And there's, there's a lot of speculation and fun conversation about that mark and who can get it, who can't get it, what it's going to look like. Can you get rid of it once you get it? And, what, you know, the whole thing about the mark of the beast, that's kind of what everyone's focus is on. I don't care about that mark. Here's the mark that's important to me is that God puts his seal on his servants on their foreheads, and they are protected from his wrath that's poured out in the tribulation. My friends, it's not just for future believers, though, in the tribulation. That mark is for us as well. 2 Corinthians 1 says that God has sealed us and given us the spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. We read that earlier as well in Ephesians. Ephesians 4 says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom we are sealed for the day of redemption. And then in 2 Timothy 2, we read, Nevertheless, the the solid solid foundation of God stands having this seal. The Lord knows those who are his. If you're a believer and a follower of Jesus Christ, then you are a marked man or a marked woman. You're marked. This mark means that God knows you intimately and claims you as his own. So live like it. You're off limits to the devil. He can't touch you. So live like it. Go big. You are even off limits to your own sinful desires. Check this out. Because you are not your own. You belong to God. You're indwelt by God. You're you're a temple of the Holy Spirit. So live like it. And by his mark on your life, God has made an unbreakable promise to you to uphold his end of the bargain. He will never leave you nor forsake you. He will finish the good work he's begun in you. So live like it. Yes. And God sees that mark he's placed on your forehead. It cost him dearly. It cost him everything. It cost him the life of Jesus Christ dying on the cross for your sins. And so God indwells you by his Holy Spirit in order to keep his investment under close guard. He's invested so much into you that he's coming and dwelt you. So do what? Live like it. Of course. My friends, are you a marked man or a marked woman? Do you belong to Jesus Christ? Then don't ever forget it. God's never going to forget it. Amen?